This slide is showing you the circulation of blood as it goes throughout the heart. And I really like this, this specific slide because it shows what's going on in both sides. However, it's very difficult for students to understand this because the heart is a dual pump. And the term dual pump is important to understand in that it describes the fact that the um, right side of the heart is a pump and the left side of the heart is a pump. However, those, those sides, those two pumps are working at the same time. So each side supplies its own circuit. So we're going to start looking at the right atrium, which is usually where people describe this first when they trace the pathway of blood as it goes throughout the heart. So first of all, we start with deoxygenated blood over that's going into the right atrium, and it goes into the right atrium through these three blood vessels. Now the coronary sinus is one of the cardiac veins, because remember, blood has to be delivered to the myocardium as well. So um, remember that if it's blue, it's signifying deoxygenated blood or poorly oxygenated blood. So from here, the blood goes uh, from the right atrium into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. And the tricuspid valve is the right atrioventricular valve. So those two things mean the same thing. And the purpose of the right side of the heart is to deliver deoxygenated blood to the lungs to put, pick up oxygen. So blood leaves the right ventricle. It goes out the pulmonary semilunar valve. And the pulmonary semilunar valve is located right in this area. So the pulmonary semilunar valve is going to allow blood to leave the right ventricle. It goes out into the pulmonary trunk, which then goes into the pulmonary arteries. And one important thing to know is that arteries always take blood away from the heart, whereas veins always deliver blood back towards the heart. So as we follow through the rest of the right side of the heart, Blood is now on its way to the lungs to pick up oxygen. So that's the job of the right side of the heart. The left side of the heart is going to be receiving fresh oxygenated blood into the left atrium. And it receives this through pulmonary veins, which are found on both sides of the heart. The right atrium kind of covers these two up. But if we look on the poster side of the heart, we can see them. So there's two on each side, so four total. Deliver that freshly oxygenated blood that's returning from the lungs to the heart, and it goes through the mitral valve, which is the bicuspid valve, and that's right here. And we see this labeled over here, the mitral valve. Remember, that's also the left at um, atrioventricular valve. So blood is now in the left ventricle at this point, and it now goes from the left ventricle out to the entire system. So the reason that this myocardial wall is so thick is because it has to generate enough pressure to, del to deliver blood to the entire body very, very quickly. So blood goes through the aortic semilunar valve right here, uh, which we really can't see in this case. This is the pulmonary semilunar valve. The aortic semilunar valve um, leads then to the aorta. And the aorta is where there's going to have extremely high pressure. So our next slide is the pathway of blood as it goes through the heart. And it's kind of hard to imagine that we have blood equal volumes of blood on both sides but that's the case so there it's important to remember there's equal amount of blood on each side but the right side is going to the pulmonary circuit and the left side is the systemic circuit so one important thing to remember is that the pulmonary circuit is very short which makes sense because the pulmonary uh, the lungs are just next door whereas the systemic circuit is very long 
and there has to be high pressure. So for that reason, the left ventricular wall is three times thicker than the right side. As we saw with the myocardial wall, it has much greater pressure. So what's interesting is on the right side of the heart, in the right ventricle, the pressure is only about 20 millimeters of mercury, which is significantly less than what's on the left side. The pressure is around at least 120 millimeters of mercury. So those are pretty amazing um, numbers to imagine. So we've talked about the pulmonary circulation, we've talked about the systemic circulation, we just haven't talked about the coronary circulation yet. The coronary circulation is what includes the um, coronary blood vessels and they, it is the shortest circulation in the body. Blood comes directly off of the aorta and it delivers oxygen to the myocardium. So the coronary arteries begin with the left and the right coronary arteries. They arise from the bottom of the aorta and they then branch into other blood vessels. They contain many anastomoses. Anastomosis is a junction. It is where there are um, there can be combinations of blood vessels. And this is what's really interesting is this happens after a cardiovascular incident. There's going to be natural anastomoses that form. So the different coronary blood vessels you should be aware of are the, the two main ones first are the left and the right coronary arteries and the left coronary artery branches into the anterior interventricular artery. It's also called the left anterior descending artery and it's also called the widow maker because it causes, um, it kills a lot of men leaving widows. So that's the front, but then on the side, the cor left coronary artery becomes a circumflex artery. So we'll look at that next. Might be easier if I go uh, back and forth here. So we have the left coronary artery. It is going to lead to two different blood vessels. The first one is the anterior interventricular artery and the circumflex artery, which is on the side of the heart. So those are the two branches to know. When we look at the right coronary artery, it, all, it is going to branch into the right marginal artery and the posterior interventricular artery in the back. And this is a long artery that circles around the right side of the heart and it supplies the SA and the AV node, also part of the interventricular septum. So let's take a look at that now. We see the right coronary artery here, and it's going to end up wrapping all the way around to the back of the heart, and it then leads to the right marginal artery in the front. It's a smaller one down here, and the posterior interventricular artery, which would be in the back. That's why it looks kind of, has a lighter color on this diagram. So the coronary veins now are gonna be the blood vessels that are, are going to return the carbon dioxide from the myocardium back eventually to the right side of the heart so that it can pick up oxygen from the lungs. So those coronary veins include the coronary sinus and the coronary sinus has um, it basically receives deoxygenated blood from three different blood vessels the great cardiac vein the middle cardiac vein and also the small cardiac vein and these three we can see um, over on the right side of your diagram. And the great cardiac vein, it's important to remember that that runs alongside the anterior interventricular artery. 
the small cardiac vein is going to run kind of alongside the right marginal artery. And then the middle cardiac vein is going to be in the back of the heart. It's going to run alongside the posterior interventricular artery. So those are all of the main coronary blood vessels that you should be aware of. And um, the problem with these is there can be myocardial infarctions that happen because of this. The symptom of this is thoracic pain caused by a deficiency of blood delivered to a myocardium, and that's called angina pectoris and it can lead to a myocardial infarction called a heart attack, commonly called that, and it's a prolonged coronary blockage. So when one of these blood vessels, like the anterior interventricular, is blocked, it's due to a thrombus that's formed, which you learn about in the blood chapter, and it can lead to ischemic heart disease. Symptoms include pain in the chest and referred pain that radiates to the medial side of the arm. So the, the referred pain, uh, you learned about that a long time ago, but we're bringing it up again because it's very, very important for a symptom of myocardial infarction.